welcome to the next uh, episode about business models. Uh, so we will continue our exploration of, of various business models and how they relate to uh, to open source licensing and open source community and so on. So let's dive straight into it. Great. The next model uh, is physical products, which I think is kind of interesting. So instead of paying for software or even being aware that you pay for software, you pay for a physical product containing open source to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, it, Android the, is there. The, yeah, so it, and it's super common in that perspective. Exactly. But so basically everybody has it in their pocket <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, there must be more products with open source in them than without, I would say, Absolutely. today, if you look at gizmos. Yes, um, exactly. Especially now that Linux is so big inside of uh, embedded devices, uh, you have Linux basically almost everywhere. Yeah, and it's always kind of good, cool when you get this thick paper book with with, with the GNU licenses <laughs> when, when you buy a, <laughs> some cheap yeah. gizmo in in some uh, some store. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, it, what fascinates me is that you can actually add value to a product by doing this mm -hmm. so so to me it, it's nice when the product is hacker friendly where where i can actually change the firmware where where it's open where the firmware comes from exactly um so i mean it, it allows me to uh, to extend the life of the product or adapt it to my use cases uh, and the funny thing is once they release for example the firmware uh, other people will contribute so i'm i'm thinking about a specific thing which is the conbi stick which is a, a usb stick which you can buy for i think 20 or 30 euros and it connects to your zigbee devices so we, which then can you, you can communicate uh, like uh, switching on and off uh, Philips Hue lamps and stuff like that, and this Conbi stick has uh, has a free uh, firmware, so you can get, just go on Git GitHub and download it, build it yourself, change it, whatever you want, and contribute back. And because people are contributing back, new people are buying more of those Conbi sticks because new devices are supported. Uh, which you can uh, connect to. So it, it's gotten quite big uh, in this uh, community, uh, this Conbi stick, and they have a second version and a lot of people are buying those just because it's it's so open so that more and more, uh, you as a user get more and more from it because it has this open uh, firmware. I mean, th there are lots of these like hacker-friendly products like like the conbi stick as you say you know i mean technically i, I think you can classify the the ardinos and the the raspberry Absolutely, pis yeah. and so on there and the, like the pine 64s and all of that yeah. um, and then there are all the consumer goods where you don't really see that it's software um something yeah. that fascinates me is is the ones that come in the middle so I'm, I'm thinking about routers for instance uh mm -hmm. what's the name of this firmware uh, uh, WRT. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, last time I, I got a router, it was actually pre-installed with a, I think it was a Netgear derived okay. firmware that was WRTE and they provide instructions for how to sort of, you can upload your own firmware. Everything supports it out of the box. Exactly. Um, so it's, I, it's something my mom could buy because it's a router, but it's yes. something that adds more value to me because they choose to make it open. Exactly. Uh, I uh, That was also a reason why I bought a Lynxis uh, router because of the fact that you can just flash it with open source software if you don't like the uh, their software. Absolutely. But yeah, as you say, my dad would also be just buy the same thing but just use the, the pre-installed inst uh, stuff. Exactly, and then you can get, I mean, that's this whole extending the life of a product, then, then you can connect 4G modems and stuff to it that perhaps the USB stick was only meant for file sharing from the beginning and so on. So there, yeah, to, to me, that really adds value. And it also has to do with this, uh, the greener aspect that, that mm -hmm. why do we have to throw electronics away? If, if we can repurpose it, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. 
So obviously, if you sell devices, you want to sell more. But sometimes m- uh, making it green, making it uh, possible to hack, making it possible to extend the life makes people buy next time when they need one your device and not something proprietary. Exactly. Um, and I mean, th- this is quite interesting. We we talked about Qt earlier on. And I mean, Nokia acquired Trolltech, which was then a software company, and shifted it over to uh, to sort of a handset business where they wanted to maximize the, the utilization of the software. So they made Qt even more open uh, just to, to attract more Qt developers and build the talent pool because their income stream was the physical handsets. Um, ah, yeah, so yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's... Um, both you and I work in an industry where it, some of the open source licenses are questioned. I mean, it's it's <laughs> VPL v3, for instance, that the reasoning seems to be sort of liability and regulatory things to be able to sell, in this case, cars. I guess yes. it could probably apply to medical equipment as well. But at the same time, they, they let someone like me change brake pads <laughs> which exactly. i would be more worried about <laughs> but, uh, i mean i hope to see a change here sometime to to actually make make devices more hackable and i mean you have the whole right to repair movement exactly and yeah. all of that so i think it's yeah as you say it's it's a back and forth between the users and the companies and the lawyers and so on and so on definitely and i mean the I had a hard time coming up with with uh, consumer examples, but we we have I mean everything from a hacker device like the Raspberry Pi and and really limited devices or limited. My mom wouldn't buy a Pine sixty four in that way limited, no. <laughs> but very but, open. But we have the if you look at the Android, which to me is an open core thing, but it contains open source. It's definitely made available or made possible because of open source yeah. and also routers, conbees. Yeah. Also, I th- I'm thinking about all those boxes which you buy uh, for for having like a uh, a lot a bunch of services at home where sometimes there's a Raspberry Pi in pre-installed software which you just buy as a package. Sometimes it's a specific hardware uh, and you buy it, and then you have a like, like a, a, a web web server way uh, with with a uh, possibility to host a lot of things everything pre-installed uh, and so on and ju- you just buy ha- the hardware and there are a lot of those uh, those devices actually even if though if they are always they start as small and not not many people buy them yet because uh, it's much easier just to go to google and get a gmail address instead of hosting your own email server at home uh, from from a smaller company and so on but i think it will uh, it, people are getting better at understanding all the privacy concerns and this will be bigger in the future i think yeah, and I think there will be regulations because you have the like the Nest story where you basically brick uh, the hardware devices by disabling the cloud side, uh, right to repair. Where I, I mean, there are very strong laws preventing this, especially in the US. And I mean, yeah. it's a counter movement, and and combined on that with the whole like green and, and movement with climate emergency and so on, it it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. To to regulate in this direction. And I don't think it what what it does prevent is is overcharging. Why why would you subscribe to a physical product? Then it, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, let, buy your buy hackable things. It's fun and and, yeah. and good for the environment. <laughs> Hopefully, and, if, <laughs> and it helps those companies which which do offer those things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, then these might be more expensive, uh, but it's also because they are useful for a longer period and uh, and might have a higher quality because of that, and or more I think expensive of, components. Often, when I'm thinking about uh, the those Google Home, now what is it called? Those those small speakers. Yep. They are so cheap because Google wants to have a device uh, connected to their server at home in your 
bedroom basically so the hardware would be much more expensive so you are paying less with money but you are paying a lot of uh, with privacy which is also quite concerning to to a lot of people definitely so another quite popular model um seems to be the open core mm -hmm. uh where you have an open source project um that is is publicly available you can do like early adopters and and uh, the self-hosting crowd that wants to run this on their own infrastructure and and hobbyists can get into it but you also add extensions proprietary extensions to that and that's really where the money stream comes from mm -hmm. um, i mean in theory you can get code contributors back from the community but i'm not sure how how much of that actually takes place i look I, I think it does uh, happen i'm looking at uh, gitlab for example i'm not sure if you have it as an example I but do. gitlab has the uh, has exactly this uh, where they have open core so you ha you get the whole thing you can install it and so on and they have uh, their own gitlab instance for for issues and you can contribute back and it does happen Obviously, they are still the main uh, contributor, but people want sometimes uh, some small feature, so they implement it and get it uh, back into into the core, basically. And I mean, th this has to do then with the trust between the community and the company owning the product. Uh, yes. so, so, I mean, if, if you feel that you get a large portion of the product, then, then you might be able to or willing to spend your time. Uh, but if there is no trust, then then I guess the contributions won't come either. Yes, um, that's true. Yeah, especially it, it's it's really dependent on the project. Exactly what you say. If I feel that I get anyway most of the stuff when I contribute, then I feel that I'm as a developer getting things for my value for my time basically but if they just take take it and most of the stuff is anyway <laughs> closed source then it's not it's not that uh, attractive for me to to contribute yeah i mean some comments from a, from a licensing perspective then is that this usually leads to quite complex licenses so the the provider needs to be able to mix in proprietary or closed source addition to the open source project. Um, there might be contribution license agreements to, to make sure that they have copyright to allow them to do this or or the open source licenses themselves might be uh, might look a bit odd, so to speak. Um, it should work well with uh, like really permissive licenses like MIT and BSD. That would work well. And I mean, if you use some, some weak copyleft, I think it would work as well. Mm -hmm. um, even with strong copyright, if you make sure that the hooks are so, so that you don't do linking or derivative work, so to speak, but rather provide like REST interfaces and web hooks and stuff, you can still build these things. Yes. Um, you, you might even be able to sort of cooperate around the database, I guess. If if you want like integration with the user database, you can you can have another tool that pokes into the database that the open source project uses. Um, yeah, yeah, there are always <laughs> ways <laughs> of IPCs it, 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 and so on. <laughs> yeah, but you you still need to be a bit careful there, and it might reflect on the licensing or or the the architecture of the setup. Yeah, especially on. the architecture. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and this again is one of those things that I think combines quite well with services. I, I mean, even for the open source part, the supplier or even someone else can sort of sell installation services and, and those things uh, in addition to, to these commercial add-ons. Yes. Um, so when it comes to examples, you mentioned GitLab. Um, I mentioned Qt to some extent uh, that there has been add-ons uh, given there. I'm not sure if we have other good examples. Yeah, we my... have we have Confluence and Jira, for example, from Atlassian. They do do they have an open source base? They used to, I think, at least. Could be. I'm not sure. 
I mean, you can self-host these tools. Yeah, but that's not open source. It's no, just that's that that's true, but it, it get generally the code. works easier if it is open source. Okay, I, I, I will not... Um, I'm not 100%, but that was my understanding before, at least. I think uh, it's... Uh, Atlassian has... I don't think it's Confluence and Jira, but I think Atlassian has... Uh, what was it? Uh, one of the other tools... Uh, which they host code and so on on Bitbucket. Bitbucket. So early versions of Bitbucket were written in Python, and there were perhaps it's still, but they were quite like open core, and then you could could add stuff to it. I'm uh, also not one hundred percent sure, but I know that there was something from Atlassian which was open source. Yeah, apparently oh, oh. Jira is not open source. I do know that uh, at least Confluence is written in Java from the error messages you get. When you say <laughs> yes, <page>. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it it's Bitbucket, which was uh, open source, or still is. I don't remember. Uh, what more? Uh, open core. Yeah, I guess it's mostly like bigger, bigger things which you run. Uh, but I can't come up with something br- uh, good either. <laughs> I mean, commonly it's like, if you look at GitLab, you get like LDAB uh, integrations and, and stuff So for sort of enterprise grade integrations. Yeah. These kind of things that are, they aren't really useful for home user uh, or, or a small open source project. Yeah. Um, and and when you have a big enterprise user, they probably want to pay for it anyway because they want the the, the service agreements and all of that around it. It's exactly yes. it's a way to fund the open source part of it. But I think uh, I might be wrong, but I get the feeling at least that it's not not something the open source community is very so so the purists are not very fond of because they feel that it uh, mud muds. Uh, mud is so uh, water so so you, you still you still can say yeah yeah our stuff is open source but really only like really small parts are open source so you market it as open source but only small parts are open source uh, if you want it to be useful you'll need the enterprise version anyway exactly yeah, yeah. And i mean this links back to the contribution part i mean if you provide enough as open source you might actually be able to get the benefits of being an open source project so you get community maintenance community fixes and these things if it's just a marketing gimmick basically then then the community won't exist in that way at least yeah yes exactly yeah. and that concludes the second episode about business models you can as always resource at uh, foss-north.se slash pod um or follow us on youtube and comftube enjoy bye bye